All right, we'll get the slide set, show set up from the current slide. And let me go over these few, there it goes, uh, these few remaining announcements. Okay. Uh, finally got your syllabus completed and up on Blackboard. Your research paper, general instructions, I had those done for a while. Got those up on Blackboard. My locator card, hang on to that thought for a minute, it's on Blackboard. Um, I can't remember if I had been given or found any websites that I found particularly useful for the course, but I did put all of the PowerPoints up there that we're going to use this term, all the chapters that we're going to cover. And I put the link to the YouTube videos of the other classes we've had. So they're all up on Blackboard, okay? I found out after I had done all that, that it looks like they might pay me for an overload. But if they pay me for an overload, I have to work extra hours. So therefore my office hours are going to change, and that will change both on the um, syllabus and on my locator card. Maybe tomorrow. I'll, I'll try tomorrow to get those changes made. Once I confirm for certain that they are going to pay me overload. Last term, I worked extra hours all term and they forgot to submit the overload request. Uh, they said they did it at the end. I still haven't seen the money yet, but hopefully it got through. But that's not your problem. That was issues with me. Okay. So, even though everything's up there, I may need to make a change or two if they are going to bring that over. All right, any questions for anything we've done up till now? Okay, what we're going to do today, what the procedure is, what the approach is going to be, is I'm going to continue in Chapter 15. We got the first section covered last time. I'm going to continue in Chapter 15 now. Um... What I can't figure out is why this is saying section 15.3 when we're in 15.2. Uh, I guess 15.1, um, okay, I know what it was. In the new book, 15.1 is broken into two sections, one and two. In the old one that the slide is from, that was 15.1 and 15.2. So this makes this 15.3. Okay, <clears throat> I think we got all that covered before. Um, so, what we're going to do, continue in chapter 15 until we reach uh, 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, we'll stop and have the lab for chapter, what was the last one we did? It wasn't 14, was it? Yeah, it was 14, chapter 14. And uh, also, I'll give you the take-home test for Chapter 14. I can do that at any time. If you want it earlier, get it. But just don't leave this classroom without the test for Chapter 14. Okay? The lab will be in here. In fact, this lab on sound is just going to be a paper lab. I'm going to give you some information beyond what's in the book, and then you answer some questions and uh, I think there may be a few matching or other things like that, but it's basically a paper lab. We don't have the equipment to do too much with the sound, uh, so it's just going to be a paper lab. Okay? And as soon as you finish the lab, you can go. I'll be sure you take your test with you. The last class actually finished there. They actually had a measurement lab, um, but they did finish a little early, and that's why I got to eat lunch. I finished my lunch today. I finished my apple. <coughs> and my glass of water. <laughs> and most of the time I don't even get to the apple, much less finishing my water. All right, any other questions before we get started? All right, um, we're going to talk about Coulomb's Law. Uh, this slide uh, is not in your book. There's a little blurb in your book, but not the, uh, the picture of Charles Coulomb. Um, but if you'll notice, <clears throat> well, talk about this man. 1736 to 1806. Now, what was happening in the U.S. about that time? 1736 to 1806. Any ideas? 
Say again? The Declaration of Independence. Okay, absolutely. The Revolutionary War. Our War of Independence was in that time frame. In fact, that was probably pretty much in the prime of his life. Okay? Uh, 1776, he would have been 40 years old. And so he was probably right at the, near the peak of his productivity, I would guess. Now, what followed, and by the way, where is he from? I don't know if you recognize the Coulomb there. Um, I'm pretty sure he was French. Uh, I, nothing here says that, but I'm pretty sure I've read that before in the past that he was French. Say again? Huh? And, and he is French? Okay. Now, what happened shortly after our revolution? The French Revolution. Okay? And in fact, it went just about that time frame. I hope he didn't die in the French Revolution, but he may have. But, who was one of our early ambassadors to France? Benjamin Franklin, who did a lot of work in electricity. So, I, I do not... I would be hazard a very safe guess that Franklin and Coulomb collaborated some. I don't know that for sure. I've never read it anywhere. But since they were both there at, in some part of the same time period, their interests were in the same area, I can't believe they didn't uh, at least compare a few notes. Okay? He studied electrostatics, which is what we were talking about before, the static charges of electricity and magnetism. I doubt if the, the uh, connection between the two was quite as obvious. It probably was beginning to be obvious to him. He also investigated other areas of physics like strength of materials. He identified forces acting on beams. And I don't know if you're familiar with this so for standard material um, experiment. You have a beam here, you put a weight on it, different materials here, different thickness, different construction. You see how much deflection there is that goes on there. Uh, he did a lot of that early work as well. But he's most famous for his electrostatics work. So famous, in fact, the unit of charge was named after Charles Coulomb, the Coulomb. And that's why we capitalized C for Coulomb. Now, here is Coulomb's law. Okay, 1785, Charles Coulomb, uh, and that's, what, 10 years, 9 years after our Declaration of Independence, uh, experimentally established the fundamental law of electric force between two stationary charged objects. Stationary charged objects, electrostatic. Stationary. He showed that electric force has the following properties. It's directed along the line joining the two particles. If you have a charge up here, you want to name it positive or negative? Positive. You have another charge over here, what you want to name it? Negative. negative. What is going to be the force between those? First, what direction? Attractive, because they're opposite charges. And the force will be on the line connecting them. If this had been positive, this positive, then the force would have been along the line connecting them, but in the opposite direction, repulsive. So at first, the force is directed along the line, joining the two particles, inversely proportional to the square of the separation distance R between them. If they are apart, if they are apart, okay, if they are R distance apart, then the force is 1 over R squared. Whatever the other part is, the uh, inversely proportional to the separate square of the separation distance between them. It is proportional to the product of the magnitudes of those two charges. Q1, Q2. Doesn't matter the sign, but the absolute value of those two, multiply those two charges together, and it'll either be this way if they're similar, uh, different charges, that way if they're similar charges. Uh, so it's a product of Q1 times Q2, the magnitude, absolute values of those, 
divided by r squared, but there is another constant of proportionality. You see, this is inversely proportional to this, proportional to this. There is a constant of proportionality. By the way, it is attractive if the charges are opposite signs, repulsive if the charges are of the same sign. Okay? Here is how we express Coulomb's law mathematically. F, and this is Coulomb's law, the for Coulomb's force, is equal to K sub E. That's called Coulomb's constant. K sub E. Coulomb's constant times the charge 1, magnitude of charge 1, of magnitude of charge 2, divided by the R squared. KE is Coulomb's constant. I don't know why they put the tau here. That should be a T. I guess just this guy. It just got cut off up there. I guess the H got cut off too. The value for K sub E is 8.9875 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay? Now let's see if those, new, those units make sense. you got to have Newton in here because the force is in Newton. Okay? Meter squared cancels out these meters squared. Coulomb squared cancels out the product of those two coulombs, so that leaves you force in each unit. So sure enough, that makes sense. Now again, I want to point out something to you. This book always separates either uh, digits before a decimal point or after a decimal point into units of three. So that's why it's a 987 space 5, because this book always does that. Typical charges are in the microcoulomb range. A coulomb is a huge amount of charge, generally. Okay? Remember, coulombs must be used in the equation. Coulomb's equation for the units to make sense must be used. Remember that force is a vector quantity, attractive if it's uh, uh, opposite signs of charge, repulsive if they are. So the direction does matter. This applies only to point charges and to spherical distribution of charges that you can treat like a point charge. Okay? R is the distance between the two centers of charge. So if you have a sphere up here and a sphere here, the R is between the centers of those two spheres. Okay? So R is the distance between the centers of the charge. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, <clears throat> before we get to this table, there is a quick quiz, okay? Um, object A has a charge of 2 microcoulombs, okay? Object B has a charge of 6 microcoulombs, both positive. Which statement is true? The force that A exerts on B is equal to minus 3 times the force that B exerts on A. That's A. B, the force that A exerts on B is equal to minus the force that B exerts on A. Or C, 3 times the force that A exerts on B is equal to minus the force that B exerts on A. Would it help for me to write those down? I notice neither one of you have books, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me back off here. Goodness. Not a lot of room here, but let me put it in here. Okay. Let me get my pen. This is sort of going to be crowded just because there's not a lot of room here. Here is um, charge A. Okay, I'm going to put it as a point source there, and that has a charge of 3 microcoulombs. Okay, plus 3 microcoulombs. No, plus 2, I can't read. Plus 2 microcoulombs. Over here is B. Okay, it has a charge of plus 6 microcoulombs. Okay, now... What do we know about the forces? Huh? 
What's that? Okay. All right. Now, one thing we know, these are po both positive charges, so they're going to be, the forces are going to be vectors in opposite direction along the line in between the two. No, my drawing is all that great. Okay, you say that the force on A due to B is three times what B is on the A. Of course, it's B would be three times stronger than A. Okay. All right. What I want you to do is see if you can think back to physics one about uh, Newton's third law of motion. <laughs> so long ago, last whole, summer. That was okay. a whole year ago. A whole year ago. You what know, happens okay. in a year? <laughs> Here's the deal. The forces, okay, I push on the desk, the desk pushes on me. See the depth of my finger? Right. Okay, now my finger is a lot less massive than the desk, but I'm pushing with a certain force, it's pushing with it. Equal and opposite force. That's what Newton's third law says. The forces are equal and opposite. This follows Newton's uh, forces too. The forces are opposite and equal. The magnitude of them is equal to the thing, but they're equal and opposite. Okay? And they don't exactly say it here, but it has to be true because of Newton's third law. So therefore the answer is B, force of A on B is exactly equal to minus the force of B on A. They're always opposite minus and they're always equal. So let's see, this is topic 15, quick quiz 2. 15, 2, B, exactly. Okay. Now, let's go to this slide, table 15.1. Characteristics of particles. The charge and mass of electron, proton, and neutron. I'm going to start with the proton. Its charge is exactly negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now, I say exactly, but it's in three digits of that. Its mass. 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. That is tiny, really tiny. Because point zero 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 ten sets of zeros and then another zero nine one one. Okay, ten sets of three zeros. Okay. Proton, exactly the same charge as an electron, but opposite sign. Positive 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, but its mass is an order of four. In other words, a little over three. Um, uh, so between a thousand and ten thousand times more massive than a an electron is. That's a big difference. Okay. The neutron, on the other hand, zero charge, and yet its mass is basically, at least the three digits, the same as a proton. Now, if you could carry out one more digit here, you might see, and certainly two digits, you'll see a little bit of change with a neutron being ever so slightly heavier than this. In fact, it's approximately one electron mass heavier because in a neutron star, the electrons and the protons are fused together to make neutrons. So um, that's where that comes from, that its mass is ever so slightly. But see, the electron has so little mass, you wouldn't see that to the third or fourth decimal place, the difference. Okay, make sense? All right. Here's a picture of what we were just talking about, the vector nature of electric forces. Two-point charges are separated by a distance r, okay? The light charges produce a repulsive force between them, so the forces are in opposite directions. Uh, this is charge one, this is charge two. 
This is the force of one on two pushing that way. The force of two on one is pushing this way. The light charges produce repulsive force between them. The force of Q1 is equal in magnitude and opposite in the direction to the force on Q2, no matter what the size of those uh, charges are. There's nothing here that says those are equal charges, but the forces are equal. They have just showed us this slide before the previous slide, I mean, before the previous uh, quick quiz, you would probably have gotten it right. Okay. All right. Now, the B part of this figure is if one of these charges are positive and the other negative, then they're mutually attracted. But again, the forces are in opposite directions. Okay? So still, F12 is equal to negative F12. This is the charge of, uh, L, of Q1 on Q2. This is the, char the force of 2 on 1. And they're in the same direction and equal in magnitude. The forces are equal in magnitude. It's the opposite direction. And this doesn't matter what the magnitude of the charges are. Q1 could be huge compared to Q2, or Q2 could be huge compared to Q1, but uh, the forces will be equal. Okay? Two-point charges, okay, da, 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 da. yeah. The force on Q1 is always equal in magnitude, opposite in direction to the force on Q2. Because they're opposite signs, they attract the forces. Still, the forces are opposite each other. Does that make sense? Okay, good deal. Okay. All right. She decided she would come back, huh? All right. Sakina is here. Now, if you say it's coming back. I thought she was here. We went to go get the food. Uh -huh. I went down to the office and finished my lunch, too, so I don't know what you mean. Oh, and by the way, you had asked about the cafeteria. What you can check with it, are you on the Birmingham campus in the morning? Check with them and see if they'll do you a box lunch for supper. Since you're in the dorms, they probably will. Yeah. All right. They can manage to get here. Okay. All right. Now, um, I can't quite see exactly where this slide fits. It could be right here or a little, a few pages over, um, but wherever it fits, it's still absolutely true. Electrical forces are field forces. Well, what's the other kind of forces? Contact forces. I kick the desk. That's a contact force. I come close to the desk kicking, there's no force. Okay? A field force is a force at a distance. These two charges can be separated by a fairly good amount, and yet they'll still exert a force on each other. They do not have to be touching. So that's what we mean by field forces. Uh, this is the second example of a field force. I know it was a long time ago, but the first example was gravity. Gravity is a field force. The Earth's here, the Moon's somewhere way out there, and yet the gravitational force is attracted between the two. Okay? The Sun's 93 million miles away. And yet that's exerting a force on us. The center of the Milky Way is 50,000 light years away, and it's still affecting our solar system. Okay? Gravity <coughs> is also a field force. Remember, with a field force, the force is exerted by one object on another object, even though there's no physical contact between them. That's what I'm saying. The other type of force is a contact force. These are not contact. 
There are some important similarities and differences between electrical and gravitational forces. Okay? Similarities, they're both field forces, that one in particular. One big difference, gravity is always attractive. Two objects are not ever repelled gravitationally. They're always attracting gravitationally. Okay? Whereas electrical forces could be both either attractive forces or repulsive forces depending on the sign. The other big, uh, another similarity, the form of those forces are very similar. If you write out the equation. The difference is, is the Coulomb's constant is an enormous constant compared to the universal gravitational constant in incredibly small constant, which basically means in short dimensions, uh, electrical forces are much stronger than gravitational forces. But at long distances, field forces, uh, gravitational forces act over much longer distances than electrical forces. Okay, so here is the composition. Both are inverse square laws. I didn't say that, but I did say the forms were very, very simple. All right. Here we have Brianna, right? Okay. Still missing Sam and Ife. Okay. Both are invert, we're, we're comparing electrical forces with gravitational forces. They're both field forces. Both are inverse square laws. They both are, depend on 1 over r squared. The mathematical form of both laws is the same. Uh, in gravitational forces, it's a masses. In uh, electrical forces, it's charges. And your G, universal gravitational constant, is replaced by Coulomb's constant, which is K sub E. Uh, sometimes called the electrostatic force constant. You'll hear it when call it that rather than Coulomb constant. Uh, electrical forces can be either attractive or repulsive, whereas gravitational forces are always attractive. And the electrostatic force is stronger than the gravitational force, especially at small distances. At larger distances, you don't even sense electrical forces, but gravitational forces can act at enormously long distances, large distances. Yet the electrostatic is stronger. Let's see if they actually give. No. Let me give you uh, some samples of this. The force due to gravity is capital G, M1, M2, and masses are always positive, by the way, divided by R squared, whereas the force due to electrical, that's Newton's, I mean, that's uh, Coulomb's law of force, is Ke, Coulomb's constant, Q1, Q2. Now, these are absolute values because charges could be plus or minus over R squared. So you see the forms are very, very similar. Okay? It's just you have masses here, charges here. Uh, distances are the same. Okay? Now masses are usually given in kilograms. That's the SI unit for mass. Kilograms are a huge unit, a, a, a huge amount. One kilogram is a large, large mass. A coulomb is a pretty small charge. I mean, much smaller than stellar force. But, but, if you look at these two here, and if you've got a text, I happen to stumble across the constants. Okay? We have the conversion factors front inside cover, but the physical constants aren't there. I looked at the back inside cover, no periodic table, that's good, but they're not there. But if you go to the appendix, okay, appendix C, physical data often used. 
Yuck, it's not here either, is it? Much smaller. Ah, there it is. Um, page A20, Appendix C at the end of the book, page A20, it has these. The, uh, at least I think it does. Coulomb constant, Ke. We just had it on the previous slide. This is... Uh, 8.9875, I think it was, 8.987, actually in this it looks like it should be a 6 there, I don't remember what they did before, and the units are, we just had it, Newton meter square per Coulomb square, Newton meter squared per Coulomb square, that's a capital C by the way. Okay, now, oh, wait, 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 Oops. times 10 to the ninth. Now, they have something that's really bizarre here. They have 8.987551788 dot 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 times 10 to the ninth Newton, I mean, meter squared per Coulomb squared. And then they say exact. Well, if you have a dot, dot, dot there, that indicates what it may indicate, the 8 keeps repeating itself. If that's the case, that makes sense. But let's now look at the universal gravitational constant. That is, sadly enough, 6.67, 4, 3, rounding to the thing, times 10 to the minus 11, and that would be in Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Now, part of that huge difference, 10 to the ninth here, 10 to the minus 11 there, that's a 20 orders of magnitude difference. Now, a little bit of that is the fact that a kilogram is such a large unit, that would drive that to be smaller. A coulomb is a little bit smaller unit, so that would make that. But it doesn't make up for 20 orders of magnitude. So that's why they say the Coulomb's law type uh, the force due to electrostatic force is much stronger than gravitational force, at least at small distances. Okay? Now, you probably have witnessed this before, whether you realize it or not. Remember those experiments you may have seen back in high school or on uh, the internet or somewhere, where you comb your hair. Now, your hair needs to be fairly clean, and it needs to be fairly dry, to, you know, uh, low humidity. Comb your hair with a rubber comb, and if you have a bunch of little bitty scraps of paper here on the desk, hold the comb down, and it picks them up. Okay? That says the electrostatic forces are stronger than the gravitational force, which would tend to keep it on the desk. So, yeah, electrostatic forces are stronger at small distances. At larger distances, it doesn't affect them at all. Okay? But, all right. Now, next slide is superposition principle. This is on page 501 in your text, uh, still 15.2, not point .3, as the slide indicates, but this is 15.2.1. Superposition principle. The resultant force on any one charge equals the vector sum of the forces exerted by other individual charges that are present. All right, let's just imagine that each of you is a charge. You want to be positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Negative. Positive. Positive. Negative. Okay. So I'm a little charge here. Okay? Now, if I were to calculate the resultant sum of all the forces on O, you want to be positive or negative? Positive, okay. Uh, she was 
positive, mm -hmm. and she's going to be we're going to be repelling each other because of that, and it depends on her magnitude and my magnitude, okay, and the distance between us one over r squared. Now, your magnitude's about the same as hers because you're negative. We're going to be so the force you acting on me is going to pull me this way. Her acting on me is pushing me that way, but you're a little bit closer. So if your magnitude was about the same as hers, the opposite sign, then you would be a little stronger because you're closer. Um, is this another negative here on the reality? You're positive, okay? You're pushing me back this way, okay? And you're negative, is that all right? Uh, or positive. All the positive again. She's pushing me back, back, oh, and you're negative, so you're pulling me back. Okay, so the sum of all the forces, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, sum of all those, and you're closer, as long as your magnitude is fairly close, then it becomes it here. The sum of all those is the result of sum. I don't know what that would be, but you would add those vectorially together. That's what we mean by superposition. The result of force on any one charge equals the vector sum of the forces exerted by the other individual charges that are present. So what you do is find the electrical force between each pair of charges, her on me, her on me, you on me, you on me, you on me, pushing, pulling, whichever it is, find them separately, add the vectors, remember to add forces as vectors. So what we would do, we set up our coordinate system, and hers would be a so many x, y, you know, and yours would be so many x, y this way, so many x, y that way, that way, this way, and uh, you add the x's, add the y's, you know, if you want it in the x, y direction, and then whatever you get at the end, that's the, uh, the final sum. Okay. Now, example 15.2 illustrates that is finding electrostatic equilibrium. You can either look at this example and go through it, or I'll be glad to work it for you if you like me to work it for you. Which would you look? Work it or not? You answer, huh? You say work it? Okay, let me make sure it's not here. No, it isn't. Another similar example is here. This is the first one they've done. Wow. Oh, no. This is example 15.3, I think. So you want to see 15.2 and 15.3 or just 15.3? Okay, let's do 15.3. Consider three point charges at the corners of a triangle as shown in this figure. Okay, now, figure number may be off, but doesn't even have a figure number, okay? Um, where Q1, the one at the bottom, lower, the lower thing, is 6.00 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, positive. Q2, the one just above it, is negative, and that shows negative, 2.00 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, and Q3, the one over there to the right, is a positive again, 5.00 times 10 to the uh, minus 9 coulombs. Okay, so let's label those. This is 6.00 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. And by the way, if they had chosen to write a metric prefix here, what would that have been? to the minus 9. Any more too many fans? Nano, nano? It's a nano coulomb. 10 to the minus 9. Nano. 9 nano. Nanoparticles, yeah, you may have heard of that. Okay, Q2 up there is a minus 2 times 10 to the minus 9. Coulombs and Q3 over here is uh, 5, isn't it? Yeah, positive 5.00 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. 
Okay. Find the components of the force F23 exerted by Q2 on Q3, and, and I will just do each of these. So F of 2, 3. Okay. Obvi okay. Now they give us one thing. They give you this being 3 meters, that being 4 meters, and that being 5 meters. That makes sense. If this is 3 and that's 4, Pythagorean theorem says that has to be 5. 3, 4, 5, 5. Okay, we're fine with that. Okay? It says first, the A part of this problem says uh, find the components of the force F23. There it is, right there. F23, that's the force exerted by 2 on 3. Um, so let's do it. Have they got it pointed in the right direction? Yes, it's an attractive force because these are opposite signs. So what is that force? F, 2, 3, it is a vector force, and that would be What's the formula for a force? Electrostatic force? K sub E, Coulomb's constant, times, in this case it would be Q2, times Q3, the two charges in question, divided by the distance squared. Right? That's the distance between 2 and 3. Okay? Well, K sub E is, what, 8.98, whatever. Oh, they round to 8.99. Why not? So, 8.99. Now, why can they get away with that? Okay. And this happens to be Eva's first time in the class. Okay. It's good to have you. Okay. Now... She's been in some other classes, but not this one. Okay. Um, since a couple of people have come in since I started the class, let me recite state this. We're just missing Sam among our regulars now. Don't know if he'll make it or not. Um, everybody else who's been here is here except Sam. Wait a minute. Yeah. So, um, I did get um, your syllabus, research paper instructions, locator card, all the PowerPoints, and the link to the YouTube videos. They're all out there on Blackboard under content. I can't remember if I had any uh, other YouTube videos or files or other things that students have sent me they found helpful in the course. I don't recall that we have any, uh, but I do know that those others are there. They're all there. Now, yes? So that knowledge report is on the syllabus? It's on the syllabus, exactly. Now, the only one little issue, I mentioned this earlier too, is this. After I did my all my syllabi, all six classes of teaching, and my locator card, after that I got the word that they probably were going to pay me for an overlay. I was thinking because a lot of my classes are small, they weren't going to do it, but because they sort of add them up together, they're going to pay me an overlay, which means I'm required to be here more hours. Well, frankly, I was going to be here extra hours anyway. I just posted what was my minimum. So, whereas I post on there, I leave at 9. In reality, I'll, in reality I've been leaving at 9.15 or later, so I'm going to put 9.15. Um, and on Tuesday and Thursday, I was having to leave right after my uh, physical science class because otherwise I'm going to be here more than 40 hours. Well, now I need to be here more than 40, so that's going to go down to probably, I haven't figured out what it's going to be. It's probably going to be around <clears throat> 5.15, 5.30. It was 3.30, 3.30, but now it's going to be 5.15, 5.30, maybe even 5.45. Now, with this understanding, 
I'm telling all my class this. I can't write it out on, on my thing. Some weeks I might have to leave by 515, even though my locator card says it will be later, because I sometimes occasionally have to be in Homewood at 6 o'clock to, uh, and I, it takes 45 minutes to get there in, in rush hour traffic. So, if I'm going to be 5.15 that day, I'll, and it says 5.30, then I'll be 5.45 on Thursday, or something like that. I'll always try to balance them out, you know, so that would be the case some weeks. I don't think it'll be often, but occasionally I do have to be there before 6 o'clock, because the business uh, closes at 6, that I sometimes have to go and pick up something. Okay. Let's get back to this. Now, I was going to say, in the text, they gave us Coulomb's constant as, on page 499, 15.2, 8.9876. So they rounded correctly. Here they're using 8.99. Why can they do that? Why don't they use all five digits? Any ideas? Look here. The charges are only given the three digits. The distances are only given the three digits. Uh, so therefore, why mess with giving this to five digits? You're really only going to get five, uh, three digit precision. Now this may throw you off ever so slightly, but it won't throw you off much. So that's why they use 8.99, and that's times 10 to the ninth, and that'll be Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, okay, times the magnitude of Q2 is, I'll leave off the minus sign, 2.00 times 10 to the minus 9 Coulombs times Q3 leave off the sign, uh, 5.00 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, divided by the distance between those two squared, and that would be 16.0 meters squared. Okay, now, let's deal with the units first. This meter squared cancels that meter squared out. This coulomb squared cancels those two coulombs out. Okay, now let's deal with the numbers. If someone has a calculator, please punch it in for us. See, we're in the south, are pretty violent. We punch in our numbers. Maybe in other parts of the country, they press in the numbers. We punch them in. Okay, so 8.99 EE or EXP9 times 2 EE or EXP 10, uh, minus 9 times 5. Actually, save yourself some effort. This is so easy to do. This 9 times that minus 9, that's going to cancel out. 2 times 5 is 10. Okay, so uh, basically you have 8.99 times 10 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 16. Now, you could put your extra digits in there if you wanted to. It's fine. Okay? I think what I would do, too, is divide out a 5 here and an 8 there. So now, make life a lot easier. Uh, 8.99 times 5 divided by 8. Okay, not going to be too much more greater than 6, I don't think. Maybe a little less than 6 uh, times 10 to the minus 9. Yeah, negative. Okay. Uh, 5.62 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. 5.62 times 10 to the minus 9 Newtons. Newtons are only units that's left. Um, 8 divided by 8 
8.99 divided by 8 is going to be just something a little bit greater than 1. So that times 5 would be 5.62. Now, we look at this and we see that is strictly in the minus x direction. So that's going to be minus. That's where the minus sign came from. Okay. So that's the answer to A. Find the components of the force F23 exerted on Q2 and Q3. The horizontal component in the x direction is uh, that. Okay? And that's in the x direction. So strictly and only in the x direction. We'll just put the sub x there like they do. Okay. The B part. Find the components of the force F sub 1, 3 exerted on Q1 by Q1 on Q3. F sub 1, 3. Well, here's F sub 1. Okay. It says by Q1 on Q3. So this is going to be something in the, because both of those are positive, it's going to be in the, neg in the opposite direction which will be a positive X and a positive Y. You notice that? These are like charges, so the force is going to be a repulsive force. That would be a positive X and a positive Y. It's going to be along that line. So we know the angle's got to be there. Now, we haven't figured out what that angle is. How can we get that angle? 36.9 degrees. Where did that come from? It's the same as this angle, right? Which is the same as this angle, would you say? Same as this one because, uh, you know, two parallel lines cut by a line, the corresponding angle would be the same here because that's opposite of this, or this is also an interior angle, whatever. Same as this. Well, guess what? This angle. We know the sine of this angle is 3 over 5. Sine of this angle right here is 3 over 5. So in other words, the arc sine, 3 over 5, is 0. 0.6. Do the inverse sine of 0. 0.6 and see what you get in degrees. Inverse sine of 0. 0.6 in degrees. Someone got it? No one has a calculator? I have one down in my office, but I didn't bring it up here. Physics class and no calculators? Okay, somebody got one? Okay. Inverse sine of 0.6, be in degree mode. You said the inverse sine was 0.6. In degree mode. What's that? So this is 36.9 degrees, that's 36.9 degrees. Got it? <clears throat> okay. That gives us the angle or direction. What we have to do now is find the magnitude of F13. Okay. Very similar to what we did before. F13 is equal to, and it's the force, the magnitude of this force, that's what we're dealing with now, is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared times, and these are both positive, so I'll just leave them like that, 
it's 5 times 6, which would be 30, point zero, times 10 to the minus 18 uh, Coulomb squared, divided by, and that distance is 5 squared is 25.0 meters squared. Okay? Again, the meter squares go out, the Coulomb squared goes out. Um, 10 to the 9 and 10 to the minus 18 would be 10 to the yeah, minus 9. I don't know if you can read that. Minus 9. Okay. 10 to the minus 9. Okay. And this is the calculation to make this time. 8.99 times 30 divided by 25. I'll uh, make it easier than that. Times 6 divided by 5. Okay. Yeah. Or 8.99 times 1.2. That would work just as well. Times 10 to the minus 9. What do you get? Eight point nine nine times six divided by five. Yeah. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Is that how they gave it? Ten point seven eight, and that would be newtons in this direction. Ten point seven eight times ten to the minus nine newtons. Okay. Let's see what the book gave. They probably put it as one point. Yeah, they put 1.08, which I anticipated, and 10 to the minus 8 newtons. Yeah, okay. So that's the magnitude of that. They put 10 point, uh, 1.08 times 10 to the minus 8 to get this thing done. But now what we've got to do is get the components in each direction. That's the one up here. So this component here is going to be the cosine of 36.9 times that. So that thing you've got on the screen, the, the, this number right here, the 10 to whether you have a 10 to the minus 9 on it or not, multiply it by the cosine of 36.9. Say, whoa, goodness gracious. Say again. 8.62 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. Okay? What do we get this other to be? Did you say? 8.62 or 5.62? 8.62, okay. Um, and that would be in that direction. And then do the 10.78 times 10 to the minus 9 times the sine of 36.9. smaller number, right? It's what? A lot of what? Okay. Well, uh, count them off. It should be now they got they got L sub X is 8.64. We got 8.62. That's fine. They got 6.48, yeah. 6.48 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. Okay? So you've broken them down that way. Okay. Those are the two components of the force F1 on exerted by F Q2 on Q3. Find the resultant force on Q3. Those are the only two exerting any force on it. So what's the resultant force? So you got an 
0.62 times 10 to the minus 9 in that way, 5.62 times 10 to the minus 9 that way, that looks like a 3 times 10 to the minus 9 in that direction. Now they didn't draw the arrow so it looks like that, but it looks like the resultant force uh, would be 3.00 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, I, in other words, in the positive I direction, um, Newtons, and the Y component would be this one, plus 6.48 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, Newtons in the J direction. Okay. They 3.02 because they got a little bit different thing. And 6.48 times 10. Yeah. Okay. Now. It says also in terms of magnitude and direction. Okay. Magnitude and direction. The magnitude you take this number of 0 0.02 or whatever you do and that number this squared plus that squared, take the square root of it, and that will give you the magnitude. So someone will do that. I'll do this part. 9 times 10 to the minus 9, no, 9 times 10 to the minus 18. And then if you'll do 6.48 times 10 to the minus 9 squared. Okay, add those two together. I would guess it's somewhere around maybe around nine times ten to the minus nine. Nope, seven point one five times ten to the minus nine. Okay. You see how they get that? This magnitude squared plus this magnitude squared, add them together, and then take a square root, okay? And they get 7.15 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. So the, the magnitude of F13 is equal to 7.15 times 10 to the minus 9, okay? Then it asks for direction. How do you get the direction of that resultant force? The sum of this force and that force. How do you get the angle? The direction. You want to remember that? The word trigonometry come to mind? Okay. The tangent of this, the resultant angle, not this angle. The result is if you add this to that and that together, uh, you're going to get a force that's 3 in this direction and 6 in that direction. It's going to be a force of, it doesn't seem like it's right. Uh, well, part of the reason is because we didn't do wrong. So it's somewhere up here, okay? And you do the inverse tangent of this number over that one. You can leave off the 10 to the minus 9 because they go out of play. So inverse tangent 6.48 divided by 3.00, 3.02. Okay. So if you use 6.00, that would be 2.16. The inverse tangent 2.16. What do you get? Inverse tangent. I guess do it in degrees because it seems to be in degrees here. Sixty-five point one. Sixty-five point one. Yeah, they got sixty-five point zero. So yeah, that one digit we're off. So that's how you get the angle. Sixty-five point one. So it's up here about like this.
and see how that works. Okay. Any questions? Finally, they did an example. Okay. Now let's talk about electric fields. This begins uh, in our text, 15.3, uh, on the uh, slide set is 15.4. All right, electric field Faraday, a British physicist, Faraday, I can't remember his first name now, uh, Michael, Michael Faraday, I knew that, developed an approach to discussing fields. An electric field is said to exist in the region of space around a charged object. When another charged object enters that electric field, the field exerts a force on the second charged object. So, that's the concept. You have a charged object here, it has a field. By the way, the field goes in all directions from that. Okay? Now, there is a convention that's used. If this is a positive charge here, the field lines always point out. They always point away from the positive thing. If it's a negative charge here, the field lines always point in. Okay? Those are the field lines. Now, if uh, an, when another charged object enters that field, the field exerts a force on the second object. So let's say another one comes in. You want this one to be positive or negative? Negative. This one up here is positive. Then it's going to be pulled in because its field lines are in this direction. This negative is there, so it's pulling it in with the force that we just did. QE, Q1, Q2 divided by R squared. Okay? So that's what Faraday's approach to this was. And by the way, in another chapter or two, we're going to call, talk about a quantity called capacitance. And the cap unit for capacitance is a farad, named after the first five letters of Faraday's name. So you'll see that later. Uh, but I'm mentioning it now so you'll remember. Okay. So here we have a charged particle with charge of Q producing an electric field. Now, they don't tell us this, but it's always pointing away. They're going to tell us in a minute. Produce an electric field in the region and space around it. Here's how you determine that. Let's imagine you have a very small, always positive test charge, Q0 placed in the field, what is it going to be? Because Q is positive and fairly large, Q0 is small um, positive charge. It's pointed exactly away from that, so the field lines are there. If you put it up here, the field lines look there. Here it is there. So it's always pointing away from the positive charge. Small test charge placed in the field would experience a force. The force is in the direction of that field. It's called your test charge. You imagine that kind of thing. The actual charge, that's actually there. Force charge. Okay? Now, mathematically, here's how you define the electric field. Okay? It's a vector also. It has magnitude and it has direction. We've just seen the direction. The magnitude will be the force divided by the amount of that Q0, okay? So and that, by the way, would be QE, because this force would be QE Q times Q0 divided by R squared, divided by Q0, you just have QE, KE, I keep saying Q, KE, Coulomb's constant, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth, Newton, meter squared per Coulomb squared, multiplied by Q in Coulomb, so that wipes out one of the Coulomb squares, divided by R squared in meter squared, that wipes out that. So the unit for the field will be Newton per Coulomb. Newton's here per Coulomb there. Newton per Coulomb. That's the SI unit for an electric field. 
We use this for the magnet for the magnitude of the field. That's how we calculate the magnitude. The electric field is a vector quantity, okay, just like the force is a vector quantity. The direction of the field is defined to be the direction of the electric force that would be exerted on that small particle positive test charge placed at that point. So whatever that direction would be, there it would be. Wherever that would be, away from that capital Q, because that capital Q is a positive charge. Does that make sense? So forces in newtons, fields in newtons per coulomb, because it's force divided by coulomb. Now, direction of the field. Electric field produced by a Negative charge is always pointing toward the charge. Always, from every dimension, pointing to the charge. Small test charge would be attracted to that negative source charge. If that were a positive source charge, that positive, small positive charge would always be pointing away. So, at any point there, they pick A, but anyone else, any point here, that the field would be there. Any point here, the field would be there. Any here, the field would be there. That were positive charges, that would be away, this would be away, that would be away, this one would be away. Everything would be away from it if that were positive. Does that make sense? Because a small positive charge would be repelled. A small positive charge would be attracted to that negative source charge. Okay? And here's what I was just saying the small positive test charge at P would be going away from that source, positive source charge. Electric field produced by a positive charge is always directed away from the charge in every dimension. Okay? Positive test charge would be repelled by that positive source charge. Make sense? Okay. More about the test charge in the electric field. The test charge is required to be a small charge. It can cause no rearrangement of the charges on the source charge. It's that small. It doesn't influence them. Mathematically, the size of the test charge makes no difference. So a lot of times we'll use it to be one coulomb. But now they already told you one coulomb is a huge charge, okay? So it, you can just use one coulomb. We'll just pretend it doesn't exist. The electric field exists whether or not there's actually a test charge there. It's what it would be if you put one there. The field is still there. Okay? That's why to use one coulomb isn't going to make any difference. All right. So here's your summary. Of electric field direction. I really don't see that here. Um, next is problem solving strategy. Okay, this is this is the uh, figure fifteen eleven on the side of the page. Okay. All right. If this is your source charge, whatever it is positive source charge, if you had a small, it doesn't matter how small, positive test charge there, the field is in that direction, okay? If Q is positive, the vector field points radially outward from your Q. If Q is negative, the field points radially inwards toward Q, the source charge. It doesn't matter what the Q0 is, or even if it's there, the field would be if there was one there, which direction would it point? And then the strength of that would be, like we said before, Ke, that's your Coulomb constant, times this charge, divided by R squared, wherever that was. Forget about what Q0 is. Okay. Okay, they also mention fields and superposition principle. I 
Okay, I think this is given under problem solving strategy. Before we get there, let's go back to quick quiz 15, 3, 4, and 5. 15, 3 is the bottom of page 504, 4, and 5, top of 505. 15, 3. A test charge of plus 3 microcoulombs, by the way, we're supposed to stop in about seven minutes and do our lap, right? Huh? Okay. Uh, test charge of positive three microcoulombs. Go ahead and continue the quick quiz is what you meant. Right? Yes, of course that's what you meant. Okay. <laughs> uh, is at a point um, P where the electric field due to the other charge is directed to the right and has a magnitude of 4 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. If the test charge is replaced by a charge of minus 3 microcoulombs, the electric field at P, and here are the options, A, has the same magnitude as before but changes its direction. B, Increases in magnitude and changes its direction. C remains the same. D decreases in magnitude and changes direction. What's happening to the electric field if you replace a uh, small test charge, three microcoulombs, at a given point, replace that with a minus three microcoulombs? What happens to the field? A has the same charge, I'm sorry, same magnitude but changes direction. Increases magnitude and changes direction, remains the same, or decreases magnitude and changes direction. Any ideas? Second? B? Okay. Not really. Okay, A. Not really? <laughs> C. C, you got it. Very good. Okay. Why C? Because the field doesn't matter what the test charge, whether you have one or not. The field is a field is a field. So if the field with a small test charge, positive test charge is that, the same field is there if it's a minus test charge. If this stays the same, it doesn't matter what you test charge or even if you really have a test charge there should be the same. Now that's my guess. C. Let's see what the back of the book says. Okay. Drum roll please. Okay. Okay. This is 15-3. C. All right. You got it right. Third time. Okay. Number 15-4. A circular ring of charge radius B A circular ring of charge of radius B has a total charge Q uniformly distributed around it. Okay? The magnitude of the electric field at the center of the ring is what? Let's see if I can get a slide where I can draw this one. Okay. Here we have a ring. Okay, if you want to put extra, ooh, that's ugly. Okay, something like that. It's uniform, though, not like that. Okay, circular ring has a charge and has a radius B, so this radius is B, has a total charge of Q uniformly distributed around it. Okay, find the magnitude of the electric field at the center of the ring. What is the field right there at E, at the center? What is E at the center? Okay. Let's take a little chunk of this. That will give you a field in this direction, right? A little chunk here will give you a field in that direction. A little chunk here will give you a field in that direction. Guess what? And it's uniformly distributed, so all the little chunks contribute the same. You add all this up, and what do you get? Oh, I didn't 
going to give you the options. The options are A, zero, B, Q, E, K, E, Coulomb's constant, Q over B squared, C, K, E, Q squared over B squared, D, K, E, Q squared over B, and E, none of these answers is correct. Any guesses? D, you said? No. No. Not D. Say again? Oh, it's not what you said. B. Okay. You think it's B? Now, B would be correct. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Another? A is absolutely correct. Zero. Because every chunk of this is exerting a field. And if you add all those together, the one here cancels that one, the one here cancels that one, the one there cancels that one. All of them cancel out. At least that's my impression. Let's see what the back of the book says. This is 15.4. A. Good deal. 15.5. A free electron and a free proton are placed in an identical electric field. Which of the following statements are true? Which means you may have more than one. A. Each particle is acted upon by the same electric force and has the same acceleration. Each of these two particles is acted on by the same electric force and has the same acceleration. True or false? If you put a free proton and free electron, the forces are going to be in opposite directions so they can't be the same. Forces are, are electric forces are vector quantities. So it can't be A. B. The electric force on the proton is greater in magnitude than the electric force on the electron, but in the opposite direction. True or false? No false, because they have the same charge. The magnitude of the force is exactly the same. C. The electric force on the proton is equal to the magnitude of the electric force on the electron, but in the opposite direction. True. The C is 1. D. The magnitude of the acceleration of the electron is greater than that of the proton. True, the forces are the same, but because the masses of protons are huge, like a thousand to ten thousand times greater than the mass of the proton, the acceleration is going to be much greater on the electron. So D looks like it's true too, and then E, both particles have the same acceleration. I think not. So I think it's C and D. What did they say? C and D. Fantastic. Okay, they didn't say fantastic, I did. All right, they have a example here of electrified oil, if you want to take a look at that. One. Okay. Now the problem-solving strategy, whoa. Okay. Evidently they... The superposition principle, they've already told you this before on electric forces. Here it is with electric field. Superposition principle holds when calculating the electric field to a, due to a group of charges. Find the fields due to each individual charge. Add them as vectors. Use symmetry whenever possible to simplify the problem. So what we did with forces, we'll do with the field now. I'm going to be the test charge. So what is my sign of my charge? Positive. positive. Test charge is always assumed to be positive. You are a positive, right? You exert a field on me in that direction. You are negative, you're going to pull me in that direction. The field is going to be there. You were positive that way, positive that way. Oh, did you have one before? Oh, okay. Uh, you're positive or negative? Negative, so you're going to pull me this way, and you are negative, you're going to pull me this way. I add all those fields together, just like 
we did the forces and sales and fields are calculated without any regard to what my magnitude is. And the forces, yeah, my magnitude is a particular. You know, I have to have a, I have to be a fixed charge thing. But in fields, it doesn't matter what my magnitude is. Uh, it's beside the point. It only depends on your magnitude. So it points whatever way you, you add those together. Okay? Add them as vectors, not just adding things. Use symmetry whenever possible. We didn't have enough symmetry there to matter. Okay? So your problem solving strategy, top of page 506, calculating electric forces and fields. Draw your diagrams. Never fail to do that. Always draw pictures. Pictures are worth thousands of words. <laughs> identify the charge of interest. You may want to circle it or any way you want to identify it. Put an arrow toward it. Only trouble with arrows, you might think that's a force or a field error. So whatever. Okay. Convert all the units to SI unless every one of the units is something else. But really, you need them in SI. Otherwise, you can't use KE. They have to be consistent with KE. And its units are... Newtons, meters, and coulombs. So you have to be in those three. You can't be in anything else. Okay? Okay. Apply, okay. Apply Coulomb's law. For each charge, find the force on the charge of interest. Determine the direction of the force. Direction is always along the line of the two charges. And it's either going to be toward the other charge or away from it, depending on whether they're different signs or the same sign. Sum all the X and Y components. Please, when you do vectors, use component notation. This gives the X and Y components of the resultant force. Then find the resultant force using Pythagorean theorem and trigonometry, which basically is inverse tangent. That's the part of trigonometry you use. Pythagorean theorem gives you the magnitude of that force. The uh, inverse tangent gives you the um, direction. Okay. Any questions? Whoops! It's now 7 o'clock. Okay. Let's just finish this. Um, Calculate electric fields on point charges. Use the equation to find the electric field due to individual charges. Directions given, direction for same as before. Superposition principle can be applied. Uh, okay, this is 15.5. Okay. That ended, and we'll pick up next time with, in your text, 15.4. In the old text, it was 15.5, and this is electric field lines. Again, we're going back to Faraday, and that's where we'll pick up next time. Okay. Now I'm going, well, let's see. Y'all want to pause. Okay. Oops. Goodness gracious. <clears throat> My throat hurts. I've been talking all day. Okay, here's your lab. And again, it's all a paper lab. Names itself, experiment 17. Now, you can use anything. Remember, this is the lab for chapter 14, not 15 that we're working on now, 14. So you can use anything that you had in chapter 14, any of your notes, any of the things that you find in the text. But I would also <coughs> read 
just because to get the definitions here, especially the theory, wavelength, the formula, lambda f, that's wavelength times frequency is equal to velocity, period of oscillation, capital T, and T is always the inverse of the frequency. Think of frequency as cycles per second, and the period T is seconds per cycle, just the reciprocal of each other. Okay? They give you what they call a standing or stationary wave, okay? And the particles, some that are on the axis, look to be stationary, those are called your nodes, and the ones at the maxes and mins, those are called the antinodes, okay? And they have some pictures or illustrations. Now, notice that this is printed front and back, so don't forget the back side. And they have pictures here of a standing wave, um, a node on this end and that end, node, two nodes in between, and antinodes in between those nodes. Okay? Now, the number of half wavelengths that can go in between a given length L, the total length between the generator and the source over here is L, and the number of half lengths that can go, uh, half wavelengths that can go there are lambda over 2, L equal lambda over 2, lambda 3 has lambda 2, lambda 5 has lambda 3, lambda and so on. Okay, so there's a formula there that would give you uh, given that L. You can solve this for lambda by multiplying by 2 and dividing by n and let the n's vary. Um, the one illustration up above that shows 3 over 2. Uh, 3 lambda over 2. Okay? Because each one of those is a lambda over 2. Each half wavelength from one node to the next node that's half a wavelength. One node to two over, that would be one wavelength. So that would be three halves or two and a half, one and a half. Right. So what I'm saying is go through and read this. You don't need to read much about experimental procedure. We're not doing that. We don't have the equipment for it. But I wanted you to read the theory part. Okay, that next equation, velocity is square root of F over mu, where F is the force. Okay. The tension force of the string, mu, is the linear mass density. And frankly, do any of you play a guitar or any stringed instrument? Not a one of you. Is that right? At least you've seen people with guitars, right? Have you ever looked at a guitar carefully? The low notes are really thick strings. The higher notes are really thin strings. That indicates linear mass densities, okay? The tension is what they do with the fret up there, or the thing that you turn. Increasing the tension, decreasing the tension. That's what they're doing, fixing the velocities which are related to frequencies, okay? And this is how the frequencies are uh, done here. So, please, read the theory part, okay? We have another one over here, lambda is equal to frequency, uh, velocity over frequency, which has another rendition of using force, uh, tensional force and linear mass density. But that comes exactly from this one, where you just divide both sides by um, frequency. Okay? Now, you read the book, you read especially the theory, uh, that's to the theory. Don't worry about too much about one. There's nothing much there, equipment needed, or too much about four because we're not doing that. Based on that, then answer these questions. You've got one through nine on the front side, and you've got 10 through 24 on the back side. However, some of these questions have multiple parts. Number four has three parts. Uh, number eight has three parts. 
you know, various ones of these. So your total number of things to fill in are going to be greater than 24. Your lab is worth 25 points, so I'll base it, you know, scale it to 25. Any questions? Use your book, use the theory. Do it. Oh, okay. And remember, it is a lab. You can work together. In, you can work individually, you can work in pairs, triplets, quadruplets, synths, whatever, or you can all work together as one big group. Okay? If you get stuck on something or have major disagreement on something, I'm the referee. I'll try to help clean it up, smooth it up. So, sock it to it. What's that? Right. Will any of you see him before then? Wednesday, sure. Okay. No one will see him because I give you one to give to him if you will see him. Okay. That's your lab. Before you leave today, pick up your test. I have your test ready too for chapter 14. Take home test. Now, both the labs and the tests are due a week from today, okay? Uh, if you need more time, you can have it, but please not, don't wait until the next one is already handed out, then you're getting way too far behind. So work on as much of tonight as you can, and let's see, what time do I call? Say again. I need to call it again at at seven twenty, and we've got another five minutes or so yet. So, all right, I'm going to go on. I'm going to pause the recording now. But if you have a question, remind me to start the recording back so I can record that. Okay. Okay. I want you to give me some formula that's sort of related to that one. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same thing, but uh, turn on the okay. Okay. Um, Okay. Would you agree with this formula? Um, distance is equal to velocity times time. You would? Okay. So how is distance related to velocity and time? This distance is directly proportional to the velocity if time is constant. And it's directly proportional to time if velocity is constant. Would you agree with that statement? So it depends as the velocity goes up, the distance goes up for a given time, or as the uh, time goes up, distance goes up for a given velocity. I mean, isn't that true? So the same thing you can do with the formula you had there. How is written that way that's exactly right now if you had written it this way velocity is equal to distance over time that's also a true statement right mm -hmm. now you'd say wavelength is directly proportional to the distance and inversely proportional to time if you wrote it that way huh say again well this one that I have here that has nothing to do with yours but how you would say this Velocity is directly proportional to distance and inversely proportional to time. Up there, distance is directly proportional to velocity at a given time, or distance is directly proportional to time at a given velocity. In other words, they're both direct relationships. The 
this one is one direct, one uh, inverse. So those, hopefully, those words will help you out. So, wavelength and frequency, would they be directly proportional? Yeah, because they're just like that. But for a also given. Got it, frequency equals the wave speed divided by wavelength, and that means it would be indirectly proportional. Okay, what did you just say? Stop recording again. I just gave these two examples out of the appendix one in the book just to say how to write these. If you had the formula KE is equal to one half mv squared, you say kinetic energy is directly proportional to the mass and directly proportional to the square of the speed. Another one they gave in the back was density is equal to mass per unit volume. With that formula in mind, you say density is directly proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the volume. That's how you answer the questions. If you're given a formula, say first whether it's directly or inversely proportional, and then whether it's to the quantity itself, the square of the quantity, or the square root of the quantity. That's how you answer those questions. No, they're take home also. Okay. What's that? Oh, in calculus? I'm sorry? No, not in all my classes. Only the higher level classes like physics and calculus and differential equations. But like in physical science, you know, they have classes in, in class. Math 100, Math 112, one, well, it depends on the size of the class for 113. The lower level classes I usually give tests in class. The higher level things where the problems take so long to do, I let them take them and do it. So but, actually, like, I'm not in the class yet, so right. I'll probably be in the You can't day. access it yeah. yet. Okay. So I may as well just wait till the next day. Okay, you didn't, uh, did you turn that in? Yeah, I turned it in, but since I'm a transient student. Oh, you have to wait till a transient letter comes in. But I still can. Okay. Okay, well, what you can do. If you know how to navigate YouTube, it, well, however you can get to my things and look for the playlist that relates to Math 125. Let me show you what it looks like here. Um, okay. I'll, I'll show you through Blackboard. Okay, yeah, you can look at that too. You won't be able to access Blackboard, but if, well, let's see. I'm sorry. 8 to 1040. 8 to 1040. That's Cal 1. Cal 2 is 11 to 1. Okay. Okay. 
<clears throat> now. Ah, oh, they're right. Let me go and shut this. 